Turkey, stuffing, cranberries, pumpkin pie, these items have all become staple parts of the traditional American feast that we know as Thanksgiving. But consider this, with all the turkeys filling all the stalls at the minute, hasn't anyone actually wondered what vegetarians use as a centerpiece for their traditional Thanksgiving meal? There's a point. And I'm sure none of these turkeys are halal either. Now, I'm Tristan Nichols. This is Refocus. Today's show, we're taking a look at the hidden side of Thanksgiving. We have two pieces on how the homeless and those feeding them tackle not only the holiday, but the other 364 days of the year. We'll also unravel a few myths about Thanksgiving. But first, Native Americans are attributed to the very origins of Thanksgiving. But I think it's fair to say that in the modern kitchen, that's often overlooked and forgotten. Now, how do Native Americans celebrate the day? Peggy Peaty has this story. A lot of things didn't dawn on me when I was a kid. And it really wasn't until I was an adult. The emphasis of Thanksgiving seemed to hit me. I said, wow, you know. These pilgrims came here, half of them died in the first year, they were starving, and the Indians did what they always did. They, they went and they shared. I was thinking, wow, those pilgrims, you know, they were barely getting by, they were having a tough time. All of a sudden, here comes the Indians, they're going to have this big feast together. And then it kind of hit me that, wow, that was a special time for the pilgrims, and sharing of, uh, of food, and sharing of good fellowship and uh, just getting along together. You know. As I get older, you know, I realize that part of me is living on. Now I have descendants and who I am and what they are are all intertwined, you know? And so that's another concept for family. You know, we're all, we're all one, especially here on the reservation. We, we all come from like five main families and the, and the, and the uh, offspring from that. So family concept in the native community is really strong. My sister says it's not a political time. <laughs> So I probably should stop there. But you know, I read in the paper a lot about the, like the Holocaust or, or the slaves, and I don't think people remember the Indians and their hardship that they had in our country. And I would like them to you know, take this time to be thankful for, for us, for allowing them to come and live in our beautiful country and you know, share the bountiful <laughs> with us. And we still are here. We have over 500 federally recognized tribes across the country, and everyone thinks that uh, the Indians are, you know, living in luxury because of the casinos. But I just took a trip to uh, Utah and passing through the Navajo Nation. I still see there a, a lot of the homes along the road there are like third, third world countries, you know, and, and um, we're, they're not all casino Indians. That's, I just want them to remember those who scooted over. <laughs> and allowed them to come in. Like America is supposed to have been this melting pot, but of course everyone retains their unique, unique identities and you always get in the problem of immigration and Indians laugh at that, you know, and go back to where you came from, which is really kind of, kind of funny to us, you know, to go back to where you come from. Everyone should appreciate that, uh, that there are many different cultures in this country now and the wealth and riches of ideas and people from foreign countries, second and third generation people who significantly contribute to, uh, to our country. When people have Thanksgiving, I think they should sit down and remember not only the Indians, but all the other diverse cultures in this country that, that, that make us what we are. Every time a group of Native people get together, we always give thanks for the people who came before us. Those people, they had such hardships in their time. And you know, and, and like Sam was saying, I'm sure other cultures have the same thing. And with the modern conveniences that we have today, you know, microwaves and everything, whereas like my people were living in these huts and they had to cook on fires and somebody had to go get the wood and somebody had to tend the fire and they cooked all day. And it, it was just a hard life. So I'm looking back at my life today and thinking how wonderful times are and how happy I am to live in the moment and be who I am where, you know, in this time, in this age. It's just perfect. So when we return, we're going to have a piece on the Burrito Boys. They've been feeding the homeless in San Diego for the past four years. So we'll have a piece on them. We'll also be looking at debunking some of the popular myths surrounding Thanksgiving Day. Today we're going to serve our 46,000th meal. We made each and every one of them with love.
Welcome back to Refocus. I'm Tristan Nichols. Today's show, we're looking at the hidden side of Thanksgiving. Right now, we're looking at the very aspect of what really Thanksgiving is all about. We all know the images and tales of Thanksgiving. In the fall of 1621, the pilgrims at Plymouth Colony held a three-day communal feast with the native Wampanoag Indians. This event is often considered the origin of the American tradition. However, the first Thanksgiving on this continent wasn't in the 1600s. It didn't involve pilgrims and it wasn't even on the East Coast. It likely involved Spanish explorers led by Francisco Vasquez de Coronado in 1541. It actually took place in modern day Texas. But in fact, there were at least three other Thanksgivings held before the Plymouth ceremony. In June 1564, French colonists held a Thanksgiving celebration in modern-day Florida. English settlers in Maine had a harvest feast with the Abnaki Indians in 1607. In 1610, after a difficult winter, colonists held a Thanksgiving in Jamestown after supply ships arrived delivering food. Still, unlike today, none of these celebrations were observed in November. The 1621 Plymouth Colony Feast was celebrated sometime in September or October. It took three of the nation's most popular presidents to actually solidify the date at the end of November. In 1789, President George Washington selected November the 26th to be the day of national thanksgiving and prayer, but it still wasn't a regular holiday. Amid the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln invited Americans to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise. Prompted by requests from major retailers to extend the Christmas shopping season in years when November has five Thursdays, President Franklin Roosevelt signed legislation fixing the holiday on the fourth Thursday of the month in 1941. So a common myth about your Thanksgiving dinner is that high levels of tryptophan in Turkey make you sleepy. But that's not what's responsible for the drowsiness. Believe it or not, cheese and chicken actually contain more tryptophan per serving than turkey. Instead, scientists blame the carbohydrates and the sheer size of these meals at 3,000 calories there's more calories in the average Thanksgiving meal than in 10 cheeseburgers from McDonald's. Alcohol consumption, of course, and plain old holiday relaxation are also attributed to the drowsiness. And how's this for a fact? It's estimated that about 46 million turkeys were eaten at Thanksgiving in 2011. The retail cost of menu items for a classic Thanksgiving dinner this year, including turkey stuffing, cranberries, pumpkin pie of course, and all the basic trimmings, has increased by 70% from 1986. But when adjusted for inflation, it's actually 17% less in today's dollars. After the break, we'll have two pieces on feeding the homeless, one from the perspective of the homeless people themselves, and the other from the perspective of those who are feeding them. Limitations on where they can obviously stay, you know, and uh, society unfortunately sets up a situation that they're pretty much castaways. Welcome back to Refocus, I'm Tristan Nichols. Today's show is all about the hidden side of Thanksgiving. Right now we've got back-to-back -back stories on feeding the homeless and let's face it, Thanksgiving is a popular time of the year to really give something back to the community, but, but what about the other 364 days of the year? Let's take a look now at two lads who've, well, they've got a solution and have been doing so for the past four years. basically started with my son and his best friend gave Christmas lists to my wife and to his parents and the list was a little bit extravagant for 12 year olds. My wife and I decided to give them a little change of perspective. Uh, we decided to start doing something with the downtown community. Help him appreciate the couple things that he did have. The experience was amazing for him. They came back, told their friends what they had to do, which also happened to be their soccer teammates. Three of the boys joined us. About a month later, two more did, and that's our original seven. Almost the first year, we were cooking out of my kitchen. 
the first Sunday that we did this, we bought enough supplies to make 60 egg and cheese burritos. I think today we're doing 540 burritos. So Christmas Eve was our dinner. So we did a, the kids picked out the menu. They wanted to do spaghetti and meatballs. I'm Italian, so I had to have Parmesan cheese. And I came here to Mike and I asked him for 400 packets of Parmesan cheese. I got him, I brought my checkbook to pay for him, and he says, what's this for anyway? Nicole, when I told him what it was buddy. for, it's like, you know, this is on me. So I'm like, that's cool. You know, here's a guy I didn't even know his last name. I came in later that week, and he gave me a key to the restaurant. He says, I want you to cook here instead of your house. People started showing up at my doorstep, and here at Long Island Mike's, dropping off boxes of used books. And it was just perfect stuff, novels that people wanted to read, and that's how a lot of the homeless spend their days. Eventually, we got into national media with CBS Evening News covering us worldwide. We've had people reach out to me personally from Australia, Haiti, Singapore, to name just a few of the countries. And then it's grown from there where there's a professor in India that touched base with me letting me know that he's using the Burrito Boys as an example of community involvement and how kids can make a difference. And that's in India. Well, I showed my dad my Christmas list and there's a lot of expensive, outrageous stuff on it. So my dad wanted to teach me a lesson, so we went downtown the next day. I thought it was a punishment at first, but after doing it just once, I realized that I was going to learn a lesson to not take things for granted. I do it for the people down here because it's not their fault, and we just need to do whatever we can to help them. I've seen us grow into a bigger charity and much more of a community down here. Today we're starting our fourth year doing this. Yeah. Okay, I'm on it. Today we're gonna to serve our 46,000th meal. We made each and every one of them with love. If you enjoy what these volunteers do, please let them know you appreciate them. I had people tell me, Michael, you know how much quicker and less mess it would be if we did liquid eggs? I said, have you tasted liquid eggs? I said, I wouldn't do it for my family. So why would I do it downtown? So today we'll crack 1,090 eggs. I use the same cheese that I use at home. I use the same tortillas that I use at home and the same red skin potatoes that I would use for my family. So the fact that we make it the way that we would make it for the people we love, we are making it for the people we love. This is my first time, however, it's a very good blessing to those of us who are less fortunate. Me being pregnant, I brought myself down here and I resourced through St. Vincent de Paul and they gave me a place to stay the next day and then I got my husband. I have 120 days and he has 90 days and thanks to the street ministries we are able to keep on being sober one day at a time. One day soon she'll be coming to bless the burrito boys for bringing her mom and dad a burrito early in the morning on Sundays. Hot sauce and water after you get your burrito, guys. Thank you. Burrito, water. And the important thing that I tell anybody who asks me about it is, don't start with the intention of doing anything this large, this grande. I mean, and this is small in comparison to a lot of things, but just take a step, do something. Start small with no expectations and watch what can happen. Uh, I'm going to keep on doing this throughout high school, but uh, we have other, other kids that are going to be the new burrito boys, and they're going to keep on going for us. If I had to pick one word for Thanksgiving to describe it for me as family, I try to be thankful for what I have every day, not just one day of the year. So. I'll teach my son always to be grateful for what we have, not just on Thanksgiving. So, Yeah, even after the time on the streets, I think that it's family.
Homeless people are folks who need basically a second chance. But most times, men, women, even the kids, they just want someone to communicate, talk to them. They're sensitive enough that they, they want to know somebody cares. Having someone listen to the kind of day you're having, what you're going through, helps a great deal. Homeless individuals are generally just people that are pushed aside. You know, they have uh, limitations on where they can obviously stay. You know, and uh, society unfortunately sets up a situation that they're pretty much castaways. Sometimes I sit and I think, where I was five years ago, why in the world am I here right now? If I would have just taken a better path, if I would have taken a better road. I went to school, I went, I worked and made good money. I worked in a construction company, made great money. We had a house in Spring Valley. And I, I made The needs are, are great here. Our doors are open to anybody who has needs. We are open 365 days a year. We don't close. Not just Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know, the needs here are year-round. So we, try, we, uh, we're st we stay open year-round. Everybody who serves down here is a volunteer. We have no paid staff. We serve a meal uh, two times a day, a breakfast and a dinner, and uh, we give out articles of clothing. We try to uh, help people with whatever kinds of needs they might have. And a lot of people struggle with uh, desiring to know God's will and, and, and being obedient to God's will. He tells us how he wants us to, to love our neighbors as ourselves. So that's what we endeavor to do. We try to do the best possible job we can with the means that we have. We have men, we have women, we have babies out here who need odds and ends. And I, I hope that sincerely that if you find yourself in this kind of situation at hand, you're fortunate enough to come to a place like God extended you. It is disturbing a lot of times uh, to see people in great need, uh, especially we, we see people with, with medical or mental health issues, uh, people even with, even with drug issues, it's, it's, really hard, it's really hard to help people uh, and with a lot of issues that they're dealing with. Um, and that can be really uh, discouraging, disturbing uh, many times. What is the great joy in serving down here? What keeps me excited about being down here is the nearly daily occurrences, surprises that we have where God makes his presence known. I was young, I came from a nice, nice home um, and eventually got involved in drugs and got involved with gangs and it was easier to live out in the streets. If you're an individual that's placed into a type of setting like this, is no other. You get an excellent education on how to survive. You automatically find that your weak points, you learn who you are. And, uh, and the, the end of learning who you are that is the biggest item will determine whether you actually survive out there or not, in a short period of time. You have to be very careful with who you uh, associate with. You need to be aware that uh, a whole lot's going on out there, daytime or night. I don't want that life for my children. I have a little girl and I have my son. I want them to have opportunities I want to be in a place 
not a place as in like a certain building or, but I want to be a, in a place in this world where there are opportunities available for my children and I want them to take them and to better their lives and do something with themselves that I failed to do. And I really hope that they can learn from what they see out here and be able to be better people in the end. I just want my children to be happy. Today's stories were brought to you by Peggy Peaty, David Brooks, and Beto Alvarez. In the spirit of the holiday season, we thank you for watching. This has been Refocus, and I'm Tristan Nichols.